Today is April 12th, 2014, and this is episode 100 of Let's Talk Bitcoin. This program is intended for information and educational purposes only. Cryptocurrency is a new field of study. Consult your local futurist, lawyer, and investment advisor before making any decisions whatsoever for yourself. Welcome to Let's Talk Bitcoin, a twice-weekly show about the ideas, people, and projects building the digital economy and the future of money. My name is Adam B. Levine, and today is a milestone, episode 100. Crazy schedules were negotiated, recordings were set, then moved, and set again. I'm very happy to share with you this full episode from the hosts of Let's Talk Bitcoin, Stephanie Murphy, Andreas Antonopoulos, and myself. Enjoy the show. 100 episodes and a year, right? Well, we're not quite a year yet. A year is actually 104 episodes because it's 52 weeks, two episodes per week, 104 episodes per year. That's consistency. You haven't missed a week. That's no, pretty absolutely. good. No, absolutely. There was one episode that we've been late with so far, and it was a day late, and it was because I scrapped the episode that we were going to run, and we wound up running one of the Gox episodes instead, but, you know, like <laughs> I had actually built it at the time. So, yeah. No, it's, uh, you know, this is like the thing that I have done the most consistently of really anything else in my entire life. It's actually a little bit hilarious that that's happened. <laughs> Bitcoin in that same amount of time has come just an incredible amount. I mean, just like the, the amount of progress that we have made in terms of where the community stands now, the amount of people who are aware of what's going on, who are aware of why this is valuable is really, you know, like I'm, I'm kind of tempted sometimes when I look around and see just how different things are now compared to a year ago when we were getting started. I'm very tempted to kind of just like say, all right, well, we won. Good job, everybody. Let's all let's all go home now. But but I think that we still have a bit more. What do you guys think? You won at what, though? Well, but that's getting more mainstream adoption at getting getting heard. I mean, what? I, I think that that the point is, is that we've the ball has moved forward, right? Is that mm -hmm. whenever it comes to any of these new technologies, the, the default status is that they go nowhere. The default status is that lacking people who push them forward, they go nowhere. And so it's interesting to note that in something like Bitcoin or, or just, again, like any sort of decentralized network, but Bitcoin has really uh, done a good job of exemplifying these traits, I think. You can push forward any concept simply because it makes sense and you create incentives that align in a way that encourages people to do it. You know, I mean, this, this was always possible. You know, that's what a job is, right? <laughs> Somebody pays you money. And then you do the thing that prog that progresses whatever it is that they wanted to accomplish. But what Bitcoin does and what, what again, what, what I think we're going to see moving forward are all of these technologies that let you do that without having to be in the same place as someone, without having to know their real name as somebody else. Just being able to, to pick the project that most makes sense to you and that you can most contribute to and then get involved because the reward is going to be there on the other end of it. It's these tokens. I mean, that's. That's the thing about it is that, you know, Bitcoin managed to do something really interesting. It managed to uh, essentially convince people that it was a really good idea to take their computers and to point them at what is essentially competitive make work. Right. I mean, like yeah. that's that becomes mining it that that then processes transactions. But the actual the actual uh, work that's being done isn't actually doing any of that. It's just creating a number that's then compared against everybody else. Right. Yeah, it's a decentralized ad hocracy, and uh, that's really a powerful concept because you know people can come together in an ad hoc way to collaborate on projects and allocate scarce resources very efficiently through Bitcoin. But really, at the end of the day, Bitcoin is not a currency; it's a meme, it's an idea, it's a shared consensus around how we want the world to run and how we want to express value to each other. It's a language, and we're using the language of currency to create social constructs, to create cultural constructs, to create community. Doge, I think, is a really interesting example of this, right? Because before, you know, I think that you're right, Andres. I think that uh, currency, these really aren't currencies. They really are closer to memes. And so it's sort of funny to me that, you know, like I went from thinking Doge is a meme that then became a currency, but I think that at, at the core, you're right. These things, they're all memes, right? They're all just, we decide that this is the way, this is the language that we want to speak. It's like, it's like if to this point, we've had the ability to learn one language and it was hard to learn that language. And once you've learned that language, well, you know what? That's good. I've got one. It works for everybody who's around me. I'm all good with that. But now we've created a system. There's a system where you can essentially have as many languages as you want. And the ability to pick one up or drop one is trivial in terms of difficulty, relatively speaking, to, to what it's been in the past. 
And so because of that, it means that rather than just speaking one language and being part of one community, you can actually speak many languages. And really what we're, I think, going to see, you know, this, the metaphor sort of falls apart, but there are, you know, compound types of value that we're creating here with these tokens. Bitcoin is big. Bitcoin is this gigantic representation of the entire cryptocurrency ecosystem. You know, when people compare other tokens uh, in the space like uh, Litecoin against uh, something, they don't generally compare it against the dollar. They compare it against Bitcoin because that's the point of reference within the space. You take this this uh, kind of base layer, right, which we now have with Bitcoin, and then you create things on top of that. But then on top of that, I mean, like, again, the abstraction can continue for actually a very long time. And you can have currencies or tokens created on top of tokens, created on top of tokens, each one representing a smaller and more specific type of value or specific community that values it. So this has been kind of the interesting realization for me over the last, I guess, like six months is that lock in is dead in all its forms. And to this point, that has looked like Bitcoin is the solution. But I think that it is even a solution to the problem that Bitcoin hasn't yet become, but might at some point become. The ability to uh, to migrate value and to really be able to to be specific about where you want to associate. I mean, like it's the internet all over again. We've talked about this before, but I don't think that I at least had thought about it like that before. Yeah, I really like this uh, comparison to a meme because a meme is an idea and it's an idea that propagates and spreads and may leave changes in its wake. I grew up when the internet was sort of on the rise, you know, in, in the 90s, right, in the late 80s. And and so I've seen a lot of changes, I guess, in this generation that I'm a part of, or like just people my age, in the way that they think and the way that they act because of having grown up with the internet. For instance, you know, just the attitude about perhaps friendships or relationships. Suddenly you have a world of people that you can connect with that don't have to be in the same town as you or the same physical location as you, but you can still reach out and talk to them and connect with them. Same thing with Bitcoin. Now you can do business with more people than you could before because you don't have to be handing them cash or typing in a bunch of credit card info or whatever. Or maybe you're having that opportunity opened up to you for the first time. Because what you were used to before was just kind of local trading. So just just the ideas that uh, people are going to have as a result of being able to use Bitcoin, the idea of saving, you know, um, the idea that Bitcoin overall, it's definitely had ups and downs, but it has acted basically as a deflationary uh, currency where if you hold it in the long term, you're going to be better off. That is hugely influential in people's ideas about money and about saving. And sometimes it's called hoarding as opposed to saving, but it's the way that people value spending money now versus spending money later. And Bitcoin can change that because it acts differently than all the other uh, types of money that we're used to. Um, so I think there's going to be a, a whole generation that is going to grow up uh, with some of these ideas. And there's a whole generation that's more open to those ideas in the first place because they've grown up with the internet. So where will we be in a year? I don't know. I mean, just over the past year, I think uh, those couple of ideas sort of like opening up the potential for trading relationships across international borders and really worldwide. Uh, and also the idea of how we view spending money now versus spending money later. Those are going to be really influential in people who have been following Bitcoin and who start to follow Bitcoin over the next year. One of my favorite quotes from Douglas Adams, uh, anything that's in the world when you're born is normal and ordinary and it's just a natural part of the way the world works. Anything that's invented between when you're 15 and 35 is new and exciting and revolutionary and you can probably get a career in it. And anything that's invented after you're 35 is against the natural order of things. So, <laughs> you know, I found this to be not necessarily quite so true in Bitcoin as it is in, in other things sometimes, but, uh, but there's definitely something about becoming, uh, solidified in the way that you think about things. And so as kind of an exercise here, I, I'm very interested, you know, what are some things, uh, the question to, to both of you, what are some things that you believed about, you know, money or Bitcoin or whatever? Uh, when we were at the beginning of this process and what's changed for you over, you know, over the year that we've been doing this so far, what things have you realized you were wrong about or have come to understand in a different way? The first thing that came to mind was um, taking more responsibility for personal, you know, security of funds, 
you know, getting used to being the one who's responsible solely and there's no one else to blame, you know, if I lose some funds or if I make a mistake and then they're gone or whatever and having transactions be irreversible in most cases, you know, or functionally irreversible um, unless someone, you know, voluntarily sends it back to you. Uh, just being more mindful of clicking send, uh, which I think a lot of people you know, can get careless with that because we do click send so many times in a day. And are we really paying attention to what we're actually doing? Maybe not always, maybe we're kind of distracted. So that's been a big one for me. You know, it's funny that you mentioned, um, you know, responsibility. This is something that I I noticed just yesterday, actually, I was looking at my passwords, I was looking at the variety of, you know, types of passwords I have and the lengths of the passwords I have. And many of them, the ones that I use for all of my Bitcoin things or cryptocurrency things are very, very you know long and I can't even really remember them. But the passwords that I use for my old banking stuff that I set 10 years ago and actually have never changed, I don't care about it because I, you know, <laughs> in the past when there's something goes wrong, it doesn't matter to me. That's just kind of the normal right. part of the system. So, you know, it's, it's kind of nice being able to have both of those things because I, I like not being able to care about that. But I also recognize that the banking system has all kinds of other kind of disadvantages to it that I get along with that convenience of not having to necessarily care so much. To me, the greatest difference between now and a year ago is the strong emergence of community around Bitcoin and the understanding that where I started off with a currency, then it was a network and a platform for financial applications, a technological innovation. And now to me, it's more of a global community. It's a global community of common purpose, of common interest. It's a community that sees the world slightly differently and is willing to take risks because we see Bitcoin, I think, as a, as a powerful tool that can be used uh, to really free people from constraints and allow them to, to trade as individuals on a global basis. Uh, it's a second renaissance uh, that's been happening since the birth of the Internet with the decentralization of information and now the decentralization of currency. And, you know, we started off with a community that was very... Uh, distributed and over the past year gradually as the density of of the people increased uh, local meetups started becoming viable and meeting people in person and building those community ties and when i started when i went to the first conference in san jose i knew very few people in the space uh, just some of the kind of celebrities if you think and and then over the last year just meeting thousands of people in bitcoin and developing relationships with hundreds of people, it's just become such a strong sense of of community. You know, Andreas, I have a I have a slightly different um, perspective on that. I actually feel like I felt a stronger sense of community a year ago than I do now because. Basically, I lived in New Hampshire with all these libertarians who were super early adopters of Bitcoin. And there was a pretty large and thriving Bitcoin community a year ago, uh, you know, in like my personal sphere. And they were all definitely sharing certain philosophical things. Like to be an early adopter of Bitcoin, you kind of had to be of that ilk. You know, there weren't many people at that time uh, a year ago and before who were saying they were excited about regulation and compliance, everyone was like, no, (laughs) this is about freedom. So I actually felt a stronger connection to them. And then over the past year, sort of saw the Bitcoin community grow to the point where now it's all different kinds of people. It is not just libertarians. And to a certain extent, I don't mean to sound like a hipster here or anything, or like I'm saying, oh, it was the good old days back then. But to me personally, I felt like I fit in more a year ago. <laughs> I totally understand that feeling. I mean, one of the things about going mainstream is that it dilutes the original principles. But then every now and then I'll meet these young people like who are just entering the space, who've been into Bitcoin for a month. And they start talking about Bitcoin and their eyes light up. And they're just so excited about this new thing that they've discovered and reliving that moment of discovery through their experience is just so empowering, so exciting. And I keep meeting new people who bring that excitement back to me. 
But what are they excited about? What are the new people excited about now? Because they could be excited about the same things that perhaps you and I were excited about when we first found out about Bitcoin. Or they could be excited about something completely different, like how they're going to make a lot of money or how they're going to get a lot of VC funding or how they're going to comply with the regulators. I think it's more excitement about this this new idea that once you grab a thread of it and start pulling on that thread, it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger in your head and you start seeing all of the implications this has across every aspect of society and it changes Mm -hmm your worldview and your understanding of, of human relationships and money. And it, it just, it's mind blowing. I remember the experience of it being mind blowing for me, but then seeing it in, in people who just joined and it doesn't matter which angle they're coming from. You know, they don't necessarily have uh, libertarian leanings or um, money leanings or whatever, but just seeing young people get excited about something for the first time or again finally for for something that is a new experience that gives them hope i think that is a beautiful experience you know there's an important part of the question here and it's the why do they get excited and i think that there are two answers to the question one is that it doesn't matter why they get excited <laughs> uh and it just matters that they are excited And two, they probably are excited because it solves a problem for them. So, Stephanie, I would argue the problem that it solves for some people uh, have to do with liberty and have to do with personal freedom. I would argue that for other people, it's a means to, uh, to, you know, achieving international commerce in a way that's not possible. I would argue that all of these things are essentially different reasons. And I think that speculation is a reason that's okay, too. People thinking that they're going to provide a service by complying with regulators, as you say, you know, and then marketing those that advice or whatever to other people who want to do the same. I think that's a service too, and and that's a problem that's okay to solve. So the yeah. question is, are we solving problems? And I think that over time we see that, yeah, I mean, all of these things, whether it's you just want to make some money, that's a problem that's okay to solve too. So I don't really care how, why people get involved. I just care that they get involved and that they can find their solution within this ecosystem because. I think that we all think that this is a better ecosystem to build these things in than the alternatives. Adam, I agree with you. I, and I don't think there's any to make money and I won't, I'm not excited to make money too, right? Like everybody is. Um, and it's fine to speculate and it's fine to um, see problems that Bitcoin solves and get excited about those. But I do think it matters why people get um, involved in Bitcoin and why they get excited about it because there are some people who are kind of creating problems that they want to solve, like, i.e., they want to change Bitcoin in some way. They think, oh, this is a great technology, but it just needs this little tweak to be better. And here's how I want to make it better. <laughs> you know? How and do they those, accomplish that, though? Nobody has really done much of that to this point. It's just that you hear people kind of beating the drum for that and then you're like well what you know what are they what are they doing but i guess that's kind of my point is that when you have something that is so disruptive and the potential to make so much money is there you're always going to have people who swirl around it saying hey you should give us some money because we're going to do this awesome thing with it i don't really think it's our job to call out every single bad investment i think it's our job to kind of focus i'm not on talking which- about bad investments i'm okay. talking about like coin validate and like Put, let's put things in the protocol that links people's I, that you know diminishes privacy and sure. stuff like that. Okay, so I, again, like I think that uh, there's nothing wrong with doing these things. There's something wrong if you do these things and the market says no to them, and you somehow manage to do them anyways. But again, I'm less concerned about this because I don't really see how something like that happens in a truly decentralized uh, network environment like we have with Bitcoin. And, you know, you could you can make arguments about pools and only, only needing to convince 12 individuals around the world to do something in order to get 100 percent of the Bitcoin miners. But the fact remains that all of these pools do have the ability to, you know, shed users. They're not monolithic structures. They're they're uh, unions, basically, and unions that have no lock in. I'm looking at this from a very different perspective, guys. I mean, I think the the main issue to me is the Bitcoin is a neutral platform and people project their own aspirations and hopes onto it. But the reason they do that 
is because of a fundamental disappointment in the fabric of society. You've got a generation of young people who have grown up during a, a decade or two period where every single institution of authority and trust and stability and organization and social good around them is collapsing and imploding inwards in in corruption and scandal and uh, co-option and capture there's nothing out there to trust you see young people who can no longer trust the church the schools the government the military the police the um all of the societal institutions of stability and order that they have been told as a narrative as they grow up or what makes society fair and just, equitable and safe. Watch as all of these institutions, their authority collapses as they fail to scale, as they fail to deliver on these promises, and as they have gotten more and more corrupt and captured from the top. And, you know, perhaps in the States, this is something that occurs now more so than in the past. And in many other countries, this has been the enduring refrain, the massive disassociation between the promise and the reality. And as you grow up, you start off with a promise in the fairy tale and it all sounds so neat and wonderful. And then you're faced with the reality and it causes so much anguish and pain and dissonance. And so, you know... Younger people project onto Bitcoin a, a sense of hope that, um, and, and also onto the internet, I think is very similar. They can no longer trust the old institutions. So they see within these new decentralized institutions, these new global institutions, uh, the possibility for a new way of doing things, one that uh, can replace the things that have failed in their life, all of the sources of authority that they can no longer trust. You know, you're talking about young people, and I think that that thoroughly describes Stephanie and I in this particular context. My entire adult life has been, uh, has, you know, taken place in the post-2001 world, and that's a world that has been interesting in terms of, you know, financial possibilities. And so, yeah, I think that, you know, Andreas, you're totally right. It's about, it's about the... It's about the appearance, not only that the rules only apply to certain people, but that regardless of whether or not you follow the rules, the game is so rigged that there just isn't too much you can do outside of get lucky or know somebody. I mean, like that is, mm. I think, broadly speaking, the perception. And most people who I know um, who are in, you know, our demographic or a little bit younger, um, all, you know, there's there's no possibility that the thing that they're doing is the thing that they really, really want to do. The thing that they're doing is the thing that they're doing because they need to pay rent and because they don't really see another way. But like, there's always this, you know, like it's, it was the same thing with me, uh, while doing my job, I would work on my hobbies, my projects, you know, running communities and starting, uh, game developments and stuff like that, that I never really expected to be anything other than uh, sinks for my money. Because I mean, you don't make money doing things that you enjoy. Instead, you make money doing things that you don't necessarily enjoy, but that make you money. And then you take that and you do things that are more fun with it. That's the thin veneer of opportunity and promise that you lost in 2000 or 2001. And I can tell you that I grew up in a different social economic environment where that thin veneer disappeared at a very young age because it was much, much thinner and flimsier and more fake than it even was here. So that wave of disenfranchisement and being cut off from economic opportunity and struggling to achieve anything in a world that promises you that, uh, you know, equality exists and fairness exists. That disappointment happened to me at a much earlier age because the thin veneer of that promise was easily penetrated and was seen as fake by me and all, most of my cohorts um, at a much earlier age. I think you essentially you're seeing that wave crest over the United States, which was the perhaps the last bastion where um, the promise of, of middle class opportunity existed in, in, for a thinner and thinner slice of the population for a bit longer, uh, but is no longer sustainable as an illusion. And now it's global. And now we have a whole world of people, at least uh, younger people, who aren't buying into the official story anymore, for lack of a better word, and who see through um, the crap. And they're like, oh, I was told I was going to have a nice life, and now that's not true anymore. We need to go for plan B. We need something new. Right, and for the vast majority of the world, uh, you know, in many cases, uh, 
people weren't even told that there was a better plan. They knew that there was no plan. Slaving away to make uh, basic requirements of life happen for you is just survival uh, is the reality of the vast majority of the world. Uh, I think, yeah. you know, you have the first, first world problem of being disappointed that the promise wasn't delivered, whereas in many cases there was never even a promise elsewhere. Uh, but it is a jarring realization and you know those who have potentially the, the 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 power to reclaim that promise or the desire to reclaim that promise are now beginning to fight back and saying no I, I won't accept that reality Bitcoin Expo 2014, presented by the Bitcoin Alliance of Canada, is just a week away. The conference will feature the key players behind Ethereum, CA Vertex, Litecoin, Open Transactions, Sean's Outpost, Cointalk, Mastercoin, Dark Wallet, CryptoKit, Blockchain.info, QuickBT, Bitcoin Magazine, and many others, with special guest Andreas Antonopoulos as the Master of Ceremonies. Bitcoin Expo 2014, Toronto, Canada, April 11th to 13th. For tickets, visit BitcoinExpo.ca. The BitGive Foundation is a non-profit charitable giving organization leveraging the power of the Bitcoin community to improve public health and the environment worldwide. Help us demonstrate the significant impact of Bitcoin in addressing these critical issues on a global scale. Support international giving in Bitcoin. Please visit our website at www.bitgivefoundation.org. That's www.bitgivefoundation.org. You know, the thing that I always come back to with all this stuff is why, you know, whenever you look at world events, whenever you look at anything that's happening in the modern world these days, you know, that involves the global stage, it's very interesting to ask if this is the option that we have chosen that we are going to go down. Uh, why is this the preferable option relative to every other possibility in the world? Why is nothing else available? And this is the best thing that could have been chosen. What is wrong with our world in such a way, you know, that that has caused this situation where we have to do the same wrong things over and over and over again whenever it's important? I mean, if it's not important, then, yeah, there might be some room to negotiate. But if it's important, rules get suspended and what's done is done because there is no other alternative. We see this over and over again in these world crises. And so I just like I always come back to why is the world that we're living in now the preferable one? Given all of the other options that, that we as individuals have pushing forward, why is this the one that we live in? It just seems to me that over and over again throughout the world, whenever there's an important decision that needs to be made that impacts how we're going to progress as human culture, you know, the question becomes whether or not the status quo should remain or whether or not we should do something entirely different. And I find that over and over again, we pick that whatever keeps the status quo as it is now, whatever keeps the, the power relationships as they are now, the way that they are now, that is the option that we're going to take. And I just wonder, you know, I mean, like Bitcoin is an interesting example of this because you have no ability for a small group of people to make the wrong decision over and over and over again. You have the ability for a small group of people, in this case, the miners or the developers or any of these trusted groups to make a mistake once. But once the mistake is made, then the damage to their reputation is done the damage and and so there's no incentive to make the same decision when it's the wrong decision over and over again even if it is better for you personally because to do so is to essentially throw away everything that you have that and that your reputation has built up to so i mean that's what i always come back to is why why is this the best option and why is this the one that, that the world chooses to go with over and over again and does that continue forever it does continue forever as the history of humanity is a history of uh, power plays and and is establishment of being fought by change you go back 3000 years ago and 
Socrates and Plato and Aristotle and others are talking about youth and the irrationality of youth and how it brings uh, change and how that change is resisted. This is a story that's been told uh, countless times over the millennia. The big difference is that sense of isolation, the historical isolation among communities. We now exist as a global transnational human culture that transcends borders with a common cultural understanding that is able to propagate over the internet and generates these common cultural memes, whether those are the anonymous Guy Fawkes mask that you see in hundreds of demonstrations around the world, uh, whether it's uh, Bitcoin, uh, whether it's uh, a consensus about the future of humanity, or or at least a rejection of some of the structures of the past by by a global youth, we're really seeing the emergence of this um, nascent transnational global culture that has never existed on this planet before and of course it's still restricted to only about two billion people who have access to uh, the internet and the information content on it but it's spreading very very fast and that changes things and it changes things rather dramatically question is though who fights the change because I think that you can look back through history, you know, there's an interesting chart that uh, you can look at of global reserve currencies over the last five or 600 years. And you'll notice looking at this chart that, uh, that each period of time, you know, where there's a national currency that lasts about 120 years and France has had it and England had it and uh, Spain. And there have been lots of different, uh, lots of different dominant world currencies at different periods of history. And you'll notice that it's not that they've done a good job that made it so that they retained dominance for that 120 years. Rather, it's because they had control of empire. And so empire is a monopoly of force, right? It's, it's having the most dominant uh, military ability to reach out and touch someone. And so even though the monetary fundamentals might have suggested a shift away from whatever the currency was at the time, based on fundamentals, but not based on the current power structures, You can see that over time, those things do degrade. So I I wonder, I look at Bitcoin and I look at digital currencies and I say, okay, well, it seems like the problem that digital currencies actually solve is that there's no more empire monopoly. You know, in in a world of cryptocurrencies, are we going to have 120 year long monopolies or is it going to be different because there's no force to back it up? I think the big difference is that decentralized information and currency and community scales better than the centralized hierarchical power structures of the past and that's that's tipping the scales to use a double entendre that's tipping the scales towards decentralization um, because the the power structures the centralized power structures of the past cannot scale both in terms of understanding the information of the world around them and acting on that information and in terms of scaling their projection of power information and propaganda out and as a result decentralized systems that scale better are gradually winning um, against these centralized power structures that is the defining theme of the century and i think it's it's really beginning to show where where to the two systems if you like or the two waves of civilization come into clashes and it creates dissonance it creates power vacuums it creates friction it creates strife as well uh, just like you know the the transition from agrarian to industrialized economies um created strife in the 18th 19th century um and so now the transition to information economies that are global and decentralized and information societies is going to create strife against the old power structures but in the end decentralized systems win they deliver more value to each node in the network than a centralized system can ever deliver And now we're at the point where we don't need to ever go to bloody revolutions ever again. This is a, this is a peaceful evolution. And while the powers that be may not like it when their power is disrupted, it's just the natural evolution of where things are going. You know, this is the future breaking up concentrations of power and, um, decentralizing everything you know there used to be this um 
libertarian meme that said uh, privatize everything you would see it on bumper stickers and stuff well now it's decentralize everything <laughs> and anything that can be decentralized will as uh, david johnson says Yes, I'm not so uh, confident that we won't see um, significant strife and violence because of the spasms of dying empires, whether those are uh, some of the large global superpowers of this world today um, or the transnational networks of power that exist in parallel to them. I, I but think that's all on the part of um, that's all on the part of governments, though, you know, like the uh, all the revolutions throughout history a lot of what people had to challenge oppressive governments was you know guns and uh, political uprisings and you know people kind of getting together but now we don't need that we have the internet <laughs> you know we we have the sort of battle I, I hate to even use the phrase of battle or war but like it's the war for the hearts and minds of people and when people change their minds, the only person that's still using violence is, is governments. This is Chris Joseph bringing you news on Next, the first true second-generation cryptocurrency for April 12th, 2014. A member of the Next community has created a site for dynamic charts related to Next transactions, blocks, and accounts at charts.nxtcrypto.org. The site is still quite new, but can already be used to examine coin distribution, average block generation times, and more. A number of projects have been launched or announced this week. IntMain estimates his work about 20% complete on a Next-based platform for encrypted, decentralized DNS and fully decentralized websites. NextStarter, a crowdfunding site, has presented a plan and is looking for funding. And JL777 is teasing a secret project that could be a big game changer for Next. All of these are being discussed in the forums at nxtforum.org. For more general information on Next, head to nextcrypto.org or mynxt.org. And stay tuned for more news on Next on the next Let's Talk Bitcoin broadcast. I'm not convinced that we've seen the end of violence. I think that disruption is what causes that sort of upheaval. And I think that naturally, if these sorts of projects succeed, disruption is inevitable just because even if it's a better way, it still is a different way. And so that requires, I mean, it just, there's no way you get to that without upheaval. But I think that it's also interesting to talk about, you know, we're, we're talking about an information age and an information economy. This is not the first time something like that has happened. There have been ages of enlightenment before, and they have also centered around informational things like books. I think that there have been um, oligarchies and keepers of knowledge who have, you know, through religion or, or other means, done a pretty good job of controlling large populations simply because most people don't understand what's really going on. And I sort of see a similar danger here as we get further into a, a cryptographic you know, world those words can kind of just become meaningless. They can become uh, buzzwords, indicators of an entire class rather than actually explanations of w what's happening. So I think that the open source movement does a lot to address that. But, you know, it has been interesting watching the Bitcoin developers, uh, some of the vocal ones over the last month or so, talking about uh, some of the protocols that are coming to be built on top. You know, for a long time on this show, we've talked about one of the, uh, my favorite certainly, and I think everybody here is, uh, features about Bitcoin is that it doesn't care who you are, doesn't care what you want to do with the blockchain. It just cares that you follow the rules, pay the fees required, and then you get to do whatever it is that you want to do. But recently, there's been sort of a hardline stance against, against uh, not really a hardline stance, that's the wrong way to put it. There's just been some friction. Just it seems like the Bitcoin development team doesn't really want protocols like uh, MasterCoin or Counterparty building on top and using the blockchain to store their own types of transactions. So I'm, I'm kind of curious, you know, what you guys think about that development, broadly speaking. Is there ever a situation under which the blockchain should 
under which something is not okay to do with the blockchain that you can conceptualize? I think the blockchain is a neutral platform. And as a neutral platform, it carries the cultural conversation and language of value exchange of the society above it. And that will express every variety of expression that's being created by the society above it. Good, bad, evil, ugly, wonderful, charitable, giving every Every possible expression of transfer of value is expressed on top of this neutral platform. It's important to separate the tool from the use that those who use it put it to. And, you know, in a, in a broader sense, I think that it provides a platform that isn't really designed to create change or to oppose existing structures. It simply doesn't care about them. It's designed to completely ignore all of the existing structures and provide a new structure. Um, it, it was never designed to oppose. It was simply designed to be. And in being, it just ignores the existing structures. And it allows people to express all possible expressions of transfer of value. Just take it. So I would tend to agree with you. And I think it's a little weird and it kind of makes me uncomfortable um, seeing, you know, this sort of conflict because it does feel like there's a little bit of an ego trip going on here. And uh, again, I'm not going to call out any specific developers. It's not all of them. I am not painting all developers with a broad brush, as some would say. Um, But the ones that have been vocal about it have seemed to have been vocal about it because they don't like the way that it's being done. And so I can, again, appreciate that if there are better ways, but the vibe that I get off the whole conversation is more on the combative side. I'm just not really understanding what the rationale is for this type of a response. And so it's kind of made me think where, where, you know, if we had talked two months ago and and you asked me what I think of altcoins that uh, do the same thing as Bitcoin, but have a slightly different name or slightly different block time, I would have said, I don't think that there's any future whatsoever. I don't, you know, really own any of them. And I think that they're speculative plays that are based on people not really understanding what's going on here. But after watching this exchange between the counterparty developers and these select Bitcoin developers, it was really interesting because if the coin that you're trying to build something on or the coin that you're trying to partner with doesn't want you on their coin and they're going to actively fight you, there was talk about trying to filter out transactions and basically starting a little bit of an arms race, trying to make it so this protocol couldn't work on the Bitcoin blockchain because they didn't like how it was going to be done on the Bitcoin blockchain. That kind of makes me wonder what are these what what about the other alternatives that are out there suddenly it's not about the code it's about whether or not you're going to fight somebody because working with someone who is going to fight you is dramatically different from working with someone who either isn't going to impede you or is that, or might potentially actually help you might uh, work to help your project succeed in a way that certainly the bitcoin developers aren't going to do so it's kind of made me wonder you know maybe again harkening back to the the global reserve currency comment that i made earlier What if these things just don't scale that vertically? What if, you know, we get to the place with each one of these coins where there's now enough money in it that the stakeholders who got in early feel like I'm good. We're, we're done with this. It's not, not doing anything else to it. Very happy with how things are now. And we'll just stay here developing as we see fit because we're the stakeholders. Because then there's nothing actually stopping anyone from starting their own coin. Since all these are basically cultural community sort of memes. Doesn't that mean that Bitcoin might just be Bitcoin now, but in the future, it might just be that might be the old Bitcoin that we talk about. And then there's this this new token that isn't making the same sort of conservative decisions and is able to progress faster because it doesn't have all that value behind it. I'm trying to I'm trying to that's one reason why there needs to be altcoins is so that people can experiment with not only different you know, block times and mining al- algorithms and all that stuff, but different sort of standards for when they're going to make major changes to the protocol and things like that and different economic principles. And I just think altcoins are important for the simple reason that they're just trying out more ways to do things. It's like, it's like evolution of species, you know, it, it's like an insect isn't necessarily better than like a bird, although they both fly, but they're both, you know, doing different things and they're using different strategies to, uh, to live and to, um, survive in their environment. Right. 
Yeah, what matters really is that we're shifting the conversation about the authority of money and we're building an infrastructure that can support these new decentralized systems of money. And once those two things have happened, then really the different tokens are interchangeable and the platforms have to compete on a global basis. And if they don't fulfill the needs of their users, their users will have a very easy exit and can move to those that do and that creates pressure to respond to the needs of those who use the currency essentially each one of these systems because of the decentralized consensus has to support the consent of those governed by the currency algorithm and if it doesn't it will fail and it doesn't have any power to keep people in by force so it has to keep people in by persuasion uh, that's a really good balanced system. The underlying. Yeah, that's where I want to be. <laughs> right. Being, the under being persuaded and not forced. But, but the most important thing to realize is that what we're doing now is not pioneering a specific currency. We're pioneering a new way of interacting with each other. And that transcends every currency in the space. It provides a framework in which currencies can come and go. But the underlying idea, which is disruptive in itself, is this idea of decentralized control and trust. And the currencies are just implementations of that. And to use another favorite quote of mine, uh, nothing is more powerful than an idea whose time has come. And the idea of decentralized currency is an idea whose time has come. It has been invented and it will be expressed in a myriad of forms uh, very easily. So there is no lock-in, there is no constraint. And those who have built their wealth on this system hold on to that wealth only for as long as they continue to support the community, the transactions, the interactions between users by supporting that consensus mechanism. And as soon as they try to wrest control away, they will get disrupted by the very thing that built them up. Well, maybe the idea that time has come is actually the idea of voluntary and consensual human interactions that are not based on top-down hierarchy and that are completely voluntary initiated by the people involved. And, and maybe the possibility of doing that at scale that has now been proven to be real. And once you know it can be done, why would you do it any other way? Well, right, unless you're somebody who benefits from having that top-down control, right? So um, you only get to be the only user on your lonely little system because <laughs> everybody else has every incentive to do it the other way. And that's right, in a system where you can't force people to participate, right? Which is where we're going. But the, yeah. in the old systems, you could always force people or somebody could always force people to participate, but that's changing. And what I'm saying is I think that's the real idea. Voluntarism is the real idea whose time has come. And Maybe just Bitcoin is the technological manifestation of that that's enabling it to really happen. Yeah, it's at scale. Yeah, that's the key. It's a label. So it was always possible to do volunteerism at a local limited scale. But the problem was you couldn't scale the trust mechanism. Uh, the blockchain invention allows us now to scale it and not just scale it within a country, but scale it on a global basis and accelerate uh, its adoption. So yes, the idea, I think you're very right, Stephanie, that, that is the idea, and, and Bitcoin is just a tool. It's a technology that enables it to come to full fruition. Well, if you think about it, it's really not Bitcoin, it's competition. It's just that to this point, competition has either been wildly inferior, you know, something like, uh, you know, a silver coin has a lot of intrinsic monetary value under the ways that we define that in current society. But if you want to use it for the things that you would use Bitcoin for, it's actually quite difficult, both for divisibility and a variety of other reasons. So uh, again, I, I kind of think that's the interesting part is that Bitcoin started the conversation. Bitcoin said, okay, so you've got your global, you've got your national currency, you can use that, or you can use Bitcoin. So now you have the choice between a national currency or the internet currency. But what's happening now is that the internet currency Actually, you have all kinds of choices to that, too. Just as there, there isn't one website, there are lots of websites. It's the same thing here. Value, as we've said, is a language. And so it spreads out from there. So I think that the, the it's not really so much about Bitcoin as it is about competition that can't be stopped for arbitrary reasons. There's no more. There's no such thing as a monopoly of value anymore in the way that it has been true for, I would argue, the last thousand years of, of human culture. 
Yeah, and that's really important because as soon as there stops being that com- competition and the competitive forces, then there are incentives for um, corruption and sort of monopolization. And you're talking about people always have a choice now because there are so many altcoins. Is that what sort of what you're getting at? Adam? Yeah, people have a choice. Okay. I mean, that, that, even if Bitcoin, even if we say Bitcoin's won, it doesn't really matter because they can't actually do anything wrong with that victory. Because to do anything wrong with that victory would be to lose and sacrifice that victory to someone who is not doing something wrong. I I guess that's what I'm saying here. Mm. The market kind of keeps things in check because lacking that, why would you use something that's giving you a bad deal relative to other things? There's no lock in. There's no ability for anyone to say, oh, well, I'm going to, to accept this to the exclusion of that. Someone can choose to say that, but again, it's about them looking at their own best interests. But, you know, let's talk about altcoins for a second because this is kind of an interesting uh, side. Um, so on the last episode of Let's Talk Bitcoin 99, I uh, spoke with uh, Austin Hill and Adam Back, who are two very serious people in the world of cryptography. Adam Back's the father of Hashcash and uh, Adam Hill, or, sorry, he's the father of Hashcash, which is the underlying uh, proof of work that then, you know, goes into Bitcoin. And uh, Austin Hill, I believe his company is called Zero Knowledge Inc., uh, founded in the late 90s, working on uh, cryptographic solutions and just in general, heavies in the space. So, Andreas, you know, you talked with Adam back in Vegas about the idea of having a side chain or multiple side chains for for Bitcoin, where it's basically an alt. It's basically, um, you know, a merge mine. You, you mine it using the exact same type of uh, software algorithm and at the same time as you're mining Bitcoin. But it allows you to do a lot of these experimental features in such a way so that you're not violating what's called digital scarcity. C- can you briefly talk about what digital scarcity is and why this is something that they're concerned about? Well, the idea is that you have a digital token that can be copied easily, but cannot be forged and therefore, and cannot be generated easily. And that was the, the great invention of the proof of work algorithm is if you cannot generate these things easily, they become scarce. Scarcity then creates value essentially by by association with uh, either another scarce resource, in this case, electricity, computing power, um, but, but also I think, uh, within these coins, it's also brand focus and attention and community around them. Here's the thing. We, we managed to converge all of these financial functions on a single blockchain, but now we have silos between the various blockchains. And I think what's interesting about the side chain idea is that can even break down the barriers between blockchains. And if you allow for more fluid movement between coins, you can still preserve digital scarcity, uh, but you allow for a much freer market uh, between the altcoins, which allows for more rapid evolution, more fluid evolution and less lock-in. Can we just get really clear for a second on what exactly is a side chain? Yeah, so a side chain in a nutshell, for those of you who haven't listened to episode 99 yet, is a copy of the Bitcoin blockchain that has slight modifications made to it. So it's actually really similar to an altcoin. But instead of uh, the side chain having its own token, so Bitcoins 2 or something like that, it actually uses the same Bitcoins as are on the main chain. Uh, And so you have Bitcoins on the main chain and you say, okay, well, I'd like to make a bunch of microtransactions. So I'll send my Bitcoins to the microtransaction side chain that has blocks that are so big that my transaction will for sure get in not only in the first block, but it'll actually be in a faster block, uh, a two and a half minute block or something like that. And I won't have to pay a fee because the blocks are very, very large. And so everything gets included in them, even ones that have no uh, fees associated with them. So this is... Uh, a good thing from the perspective of people, because again, it doesn't break this digital scarcity concept. There's only 21 million Bitcoins ever going to be created. And so they can essentially, you can have your Bitcoin on the main chain, or you can have it on this side chain or that side chain. And it's basically through a two way peg is what they're calling it, where the price is fixed on both sides. The exchange rate between each chain is set and can't be changed. So a Bitcoin on one chain is exactly the same value as a Bitcoin on another chain, but it might have different capabilities. That's the main feature of, in order to understand a side chain, the the key feature here is that while it is like a beta test altcoin, or if it provides a different set of capabilities from the main blockchain, the key here is that you can seamlessly transfer 
tokens from one chain to another at a pegged exchange rate with a decentralized exchange mechanism. Uh, think of it as being able to trade between altcoins. In this case, both of them are Bitcoin, but they're Bitcoin that behave differently or have different features, but they have the same fixed exchange rate or monetary value. So if you're trying out a new feature on the side chain, you can move some Bitcoin from the main blockchain into the side chain, try out some features and then move some of them back. Uh, think of it like a testnet, which has actual value and the ability to exchange between the two. You can use that for development, testing features, or you can use it to to have completely parallel blockchains of multiple coins, uh, but which are all exchangeable in decentralized fashion. And the benefit to not just having a complete altcoin is that the sidechain is also secured by the network power of the Bitcoin network at the same time through merge mining. This is a little bit controversial, but yes, uh, yes, merge mining does help it. But there are circumstances in which merge mining is not actually that helpful. So again, I was I've been having a conversation with Peter Todd, a developer, um, another Bitcoin core developer, who's kind of on the other side of this argument and feels like there are uh, trade offs that are not acceptable, both in terms of complexity um, of doing something like this. And in terms of, frankly, it, this is going to actually require an update to the Bitcoin protocol in order to do it, too. So it's not a short term solution. But again, it was from the conversation uh, on episode 99, I have to say, it sounds like this isn't that far out. It sounds like they're putting resources to it and really think that this is a direction to move in. So again, like it's, it's sort of interesting to, to look at these different approaches that, that we see people taking towards innovation, you know, because something like uh, Counterparty or MasterCoin essentially takes Bitcoin as the singular blockchain and it then adds a layer on top of that. And so, it, you know, over time, you can imagine layers being built on top of that. And it becomes kind of this cake that's built over time that's made up of a bunch of different things, each doing something different. But it keeps getting taller is the point. Whereas this sidechain model is, is a lot more like a, you know, like a tree in a forest. And the tree grows up and it's the only tree at the beginning, but then it seeds itself, essentially. And then you have a forest that's, that grows over time as kind of the, the natural tendency to scale isn't to grow trees that are ever taller but rather just to grow more trees that cover a larger geographic area. So since there are only a limited number of Bitcoins that can move between all these different side chains, um, is it possible that, like, do we need all these different, I mean, <laughs> I guess I'm just wondering how many side chains are needed? I guess it would be unlimited because each one kind of serves a different purpose, but are, is each one going to be kind of sparsely populated depending on how many people want to use it and is that a problem because somebody presumably has to store the side chains or a lot of people have to store the side chains just like they have to store the blockchain yeah i'm a little bit unclear on the exact technicals of that but um an interesting part is that uh, an alt an alt chain that uh rather a side chain that doesn't have any activity on it won't have any coins on it so that's right. i mean that's aggressively different than an altcoin where an altcoin launches and regardless of how many people use it it's going to have all of the coins that were ever intended to be on it, be on it. In this case, it's more mm -hmm. like Bitcoin is going to have all the coins on it that will ever be created. But there are all these different flavors of Bitcoin that you can choose to use based on whatever your needs are. So again, I think the question of asking how many side chains there will be, you know, is, is a good one. But I don't think that there's a good answer yet. I think it's like asking how many altcoins will there be? Probably right. a lot. And more right. over time, because we'll figure out more reasons why we need them. And what about colored coins? I mean, I see some parallels there. Yeah, um, again, colored coins, uh, to the conversation I had with, uh, with, um, Austin and Adam basically do the same thing. It's, it's not as bad as, uh, as counterparty or master coin because they're, they don't have their own token. Um, and again, it's the idea that a token causes bad incentives, right? A token causes people to want their project to succeed more than Bitcoin because Bitcoin, they might also be invested in that. But the, the growth potential of it is a lot less than for one of these new coins. So the speculative urge is really very real uh, in the altcoins in a way that it's not necessarily for Bitcoin. Now, Bitcoin certainly has speculative zeal all over it. But compared to the altcoins, I would argue that it's a fundamentally different kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so, I agree. So I think that's what, that's what you know, the, the intent here is. The intent here is to take all of this activity that's going on in the altcoin space and say, OK, well, you could do that. Or you could just be interchangeable with Bitcoin. Everybody's going to be used to this and you can build your project on top of that. So again, I'll be interested to see what counterparty winds up doing. Cause certainly for let's talk Bitcoin coin, LTB coin, we're going to be, you know, we're planning on launching on counterparty, but 
we're not really attached to anywhere. We're, we're attached to whatever is the best system for our use over the medium long term. So this might wind up being a better way to do it. You know, both of them accomplish what I want to accomplish. They both are built on top of Bitcoin. But, you know, whatever winds up being the, you know, it might be much cheaper to do transactions on a side chain. There, there are all of these potential advantages mm-hmm. that as we yeah. learn the limitations of just piling everything onto one chain, we're going to be like, oh, man, that's it's, it's great that that's over there. So, again, I think that this development and parallel thing is great. And I think that this being able to see what everybody else is doing, but not being able to stop anybody else. And like the worst you can do is just like get into an argument with them and say, no, you're doing something wrong. Stop that. You're being evil. You know what I mean? Like, I think that uh, th- this is like the best way that something like this could develop, where instead of one person being responsible or several people being responsible, we're just kind of all responsible. And anybody who wants to step up has the opportunity to do so. I know we kind of got off in, into a tangent and thanks for um, talking about my questions about side chains, but what was the initial um, question that we were focusing on related to side chains and altcoins? You know, it's just an interesting development that's going on right now. I think that the, the question is, uh, is there room for uh, both altcoins and side chains? Do they serve different purposes? Or mm-hmm. I mean, like, because again, if, if the only difference here is that one is inherently tied to Bitcoin, but lacks that new speculative token, then maybe that's better. Maybe that's the way that we, you know, take some of the the pure speculative profit motive out of it and instead make it about things that actually add value to the overall network. Maybe that's the way to go with it. So again, I'm, I'm trying to, you know, it took me a long time to, to, to even recognize what it was that I liked about altcoins and it's flatly that they're just their competition. And I'm trying to figure out if this changes my perspective on that. And if so, mm-hmm. how, you know, you know, I don't think it matters what we think of it. And I, I obviously, I, you'd probably agree with that. I think the incentives are aligned in the system uh, for people to create alts and to create layered protocols on top of Bitcoin and for people to create side chains and anything else they can think of because, because of the very nature of Bitcoin at being open source and being decentralized and being a market driven thing, um, where people are trying to create and Um, contribute value into the world and hopefully be rewarded for putting out value. So I think they're gonna, they're gonna pop up and there's no way to stop them, right? (laughs) And, and it'll all just work itself out because if people don't like a certain alt or sidechain or don't find it useful, then they just won't use it. And that'll be the end of story. It's completely, you know, peaceful, uh, creative destruction. What, like, I'm sure there'll be a lot of altcoins and a lot of um, ideas like this that are going to fail. And that's fine. That's supposed to happen. I do have a slightly selfish reason for bringing this up. This show is called Let's Talk Bitcoin. And, uh, and we're getting increasingly more uh, comments saying, hey, we're not talking about Bitcoin enough. And so I actually <laughs> would like uh, to talk to you guys about something. I think that we should change the name of the show to Let's Talk Bitcoin and Beyond. Um, because I, I feel like that's kind of the direction that we are moving in. Stephanie, I, I heard not so uh, not so great. <laughs> I'm open to other suggestions, but I'm just saying I, I have a sneaking suspicion we are going to want to rebrand as something that uh, that uh, gives us a little bit more breadth to cover what's new. I was just all I could think of was Bitcoin and beyond, <laughs> like Bed Bath and Beyond. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's really worth talking about. And we actually had that feedback, not just recently, but pretty early on. I mean, as early as time. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. There is the idea that like, when a new person finds out about Bitcoin, and I understand that our show is not really geared for the super new users. Although that is a way that some new users do come to Bitcoin, and they do like listen from episode one. And, and they try to find out all they can about it and absorb all they can. Uh, so having Bitcoin in the name kind of makes sense because people are going to be looking for Bitcoin because that's the first thing they hear about when they're introduced to the whole ecosystem. But the beyond part is important too because now we're going 
beyond. We've done a lot of Bitcoin over the last year, and now we're going beyond into the future. Well, and I mean, let's talk decentralized currency platform based on blockchain technology proof of work algorithm. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thank you, Andreas. <laughs> I mean, the we problem is that to like- most people, to most people in the world, that is either an unknown concept or it is Bitcoin. Um, and so I, I think keeping the focus on Bitcoin when this brand has not even yet spread far enough you know within our echo chamber it's like all of these altcoins and interesting conversations etc etc but to most of the world the first experience they're going to have with this brand is bitcoin and will be bitcoin for many years to come and it takes a long while to get beyond that so i don't know i'm i'm perfectly happy with let's talk bitcoin even though the conversation is much more about the distributed blockchain consensus network and all of its applications uh, I think Bitcoin is a good moniker t- shortcut for that for most people. I think that you're probably right. I'd actually really like to get uh, listener opinions on this one too. Uh, Adam at letstalkbitcoin.com if you'd like to uh, share your perspective. Like I said, over the <laughs> over the years, over the year, we've over had the year. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we've had quite a few comments about this exact thing because you know, again, from early on, this show has always for me been a vehicle for the stuff that that I think is interesting. And so a lot of times that's Bitcoin, but a lot of times it's not. You know, a lot of times there are really neat projects that we can learn from. And again, for me, that's what this is all about. That's what I think we're really doing here with cryptocurrency is we're going down this path for the first time that nobody's gone down and, you know, falling over the things that are left in the way and then say, okay, well, there's something you fall over, pick that up, move it out of the way. All right, there we go. Let's keep going. You know, but it's like, but it's this, uh, you know, I... I don't know. I just uh, like we get comments, uh, Andreas, about like when uh, when you're not on the show, for example, and your picture is on the cover art. People are like, oh, that's dishonest. And so I'm, I'm, I try to find a balance in these things. But I think that you're right. Bitcoin is important. Well, since this is April Fool's today, I was expecting you would come back with a suggestion that we rename the show to Let's Talk Doge. <laughs> yeah, I saw that. Oy. But that's OK. No, I mean, I, I kind of like, uh, yeah. Over time, as I've, I've, I've worked in this space, I've, I've become much more open to the altcoins. I think when I started, I was very focused on Bitcoin. And, and now I, I think we're going to live in a, in a very pluralistic multi coin world. But again, it's still all about Bitcoin at a very basic level. All of these, uh, altcoins really reinforce the same concept of decentralized currency. And most people are not looking at, understanding the difference between bitcoin litecoin doge and namecoin they're interested in understanding the difference between decentralized currencies such as bitcoin and their existing status quo which is these uh pieces of green cotton paper covered in germs and cocaine (laughs) i'm just thinking like if you had a podcast and this was like kind of before podcast but like if you had a podcast called all about napster in 1997 or eight or whatever. And then it went on for a couple of years and suddenly you're not talking about Napster anymore. You're talking about all kinds of like file sharing stuff. I think that would be fine. People would forgive it and it would be looked at as a historical hat tip, you know? Yeah, uh, exactly. So, and, and that's even though Napster got shut down and you still talk about it today <laughs> as an right. arch- archetypal uh, demonstration of the file sharing concept and Bitcoin has not been shut down. It's stronger than ever. So there's one more thing that I want to cover here today. Uh, and I think it's kind of the, the other side of all of this, you know, is that, uh, you know, on the one hand, you've got competition coming from the open source space. But I think that the other side of success, though, is the inevitability of companies like, uh, you know, Google or potentially PayPal coming in with their own competing solutions. Because again, cryptocurrency, since it's open source, has the ability to have anybody come in, take all the parts that they like, add on the parts that they would like to add on that haven't yet been added, and release it as their own for everyone to use and then compete in this market. So the competition, you know, on the one hand is great because you can't stop someone from competing. But on the other hand, it means that maybe, you know, like uh, Stephanie, to your point earlier, maybe we have a lot less libertarian cryptocurrencies coming out. So one of the ideas that's been tossed around recently is this Google coin idea that basically would fix the problems of Bitcoin and remove the anonymity. This is a concept I first talked with Charles Hoskinson about, uh, gosh, it would have been seven or eight months ago. 
Um, and he laid out this, this situation, how you could see a new coin come in that is backed by a major corporation like Google that has lobbying power. And it changes one or two minor things, but it's branded and it has a marketing campaign behind it in a way that Bitcoin never has. And so that could, in his estimation at the time, uh, supersede what we're essentially doing here with Bitcoin. But I, I'm wondering if, first off, you think something like that is possible in the current environment. And secondly, if that would actually be a failure on the part of cryptocurrency or if it's just a different way the cryptocurrency develops. Mm, that might be inevitable, too, honestly. And if it is, then there's nothing we can do to stop it. I guess the question is, will they change it so much that it'll be less exciting? And what I mean by that is Bitcoin is great because it makes a lot of things easy. It solves problems. You know, it solves the problem of uh, making small payments, making payments online, making payments across borders uh, and all kinds of other myriad of problems. But those are just the very, very basic ones. So are they going to change it? If, if somebody like Google comes out with their own coin, are they going to change it to the point where it really doesn't solve those problems anymore? Or are they going to keep it so that it, it really uh, does keep that kind of frictionless use case intact? And if they, you know, kind of make a slightly ver- better version of PayPal, is anyone going to be really that excited about it? I, I don't know. Maybe Does it won't it- capture people's imagination. There's only one critical question, which is, is the control decentralized or not? If the control is decentralized, then it's simply one more competitor among the altcoins and one more part of the species ecosystem. If the control is centralized, then I expect um, probably most copycat attempts from large corporations will miss the point and will try to make Mm. a centralized control copy coin. Um, and national governments too. If the control is centralized, then it really is just a version of PayPal. And then it suffers from all of the problems of traditional fiat currencies. It's just a digital fiat currency with centralized control instead of um, a non-digital one. And in the end, what that does is it creates a closed network for innovation, which means the innovation with lag. It creates control problems of centralization, co-option, um, corruption, and all of the other things that we've seen before. And it doesn't really change anything. These walled gardens will fail because they will be unable to innovate as fast as an open, distributed, global, decentralized network. Will and become I'm saying like CompuServes and the CompuServes and AOLs of the Bitcoin space. And eventually they, they will fail to keep up because while they will claim to deliver more quality through control, they will deliver less diversity and less quality and less content over time because of control. And will anybody use it? I mean, if it is a centralized, I think that is the key point, Andreas. Are they going to centralize it? But if they do, you know, PayPal already exists and they already have a huge market share. And so does JP Morgan. And so if we make a slightly better version of that, but it's starting from zero with no adopters, you know, Google tried to do Google Plus. They tried to, you know, compete with Facebook, didn't offer a totally much different product and not many people use it. So well, it's going to be a lot of a lot of people use CompuServe and a lot of people use um, other systems that are centralized just because of inertia and brands and lack of understanding of what the underlying principles are. Over time, the, the walled garden ends up lagging behind in innovation. You know, we saw that with the difference between iPhone and Android. And uh, we're seeing it repeat again in the Bitcoin space because of the iPhone restrictions. Over time, the ecosystem around Android has become much, much richer and its innovation is accelerating, uh, where the walled garden of the Apple under control is, is suffering from all of the problems of walled gardens. But that doesn't mean there aren't millions of people around the world using it. It just means there are millions more using Android now and it's gradually gaining ground. I think you're going to see the same thing. If JP Morgan Chase does a Chase coin, you know, it's going to be successful among Chase customers because it's going to be 
uh, superior to their existing systems. Um, but it won't change the fact that it cannot solve the needs of a global transnational community that depends on an open network with decentralized trust. And for them, this is not going to be an appealing uh, solution. Over time, the decentralized solution wins. Uh, but, but is that, that an mean- opportunity, though? Is, is that an opportunity for something like Bitcoin? Because if, if a mass number of people were to find out that, hey, there are these virtual tokens that can be used for payments and all kinds of other things via Google Coin, then eventually they'll say, you know, Google Coin has some problems. I really don't like it for these reasons. Hey, uh, there's something better out there. There's Bitcoin. It could, could be an opportunity to actually act as a gateway drug to introduce people to the real deal, which is Bitcoin or altcoins. Oh yeah, it's a huge marketing boost. I mean, it would ver- it would validate the entire concept of these new digital tokens, and then through comparison, it would elevate the discussion about the differences between centralized and decentralized control. Even if at first those appeared only as artifacts and side effects of the of the underlying structure, you know, the mm-hmm. difference being that um, Chase Coin is fast, it's secure, it's reliable, and it's Cheap, but you can't send it to Pakistan and you can't send it across <laughs> borders and you can't send it to WikiLeaks and you can't buy the things you want and you can't send it to your relatives in India. And so then it just becomes inferior in that way. It's like, well, you know, I kind of like this new idea, but uh, can we do it better in an open network? And the open network wins. The, the point is that any of these centralized systems will provide validation of the core idea but they will not be able to keep up with the innovation and they will not be able to offer the end users the type of choice and control that an open network offers. And gradually over time, they will make the wrong decisions because they are for- further and further isolated from the real source of information, which is the end user and their choices. And when you make those decisions in a centralized manner, you have end up making wrong decisions and those wrong decisions accumulate over time until you fall further and further behind a network that picks the right choices all the time because the decisions are made locally by individuals in a decentralized fashion. I think that is the power of scale and over time the comparison will become less and less flattering for the centralized coins but uh, will they still be more enticing than 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 fiat? Will they persuade people that there's a new world of currency? Absolutely. So I'm looking forward to people jumping on that bandwagon, even if they make, um, you know, poorly thought out uh, cheap copycats that do not achieve the goals of Bitcoin. Uh, they will support the overall concept either way. You know, in the future, we're going to be, as I've uh, mentioned before, now we're going to be transitioning the show towards a format that's more of these open discussions and more focused on these topics rather than being so interview heavy, although there will still definitely be a lot of interviews just because there are so many people in the Bitcoin space who, uh, you know, we need to talk to basically and who, who should have a platform to be able to share their ideas and projects. So, uh, guys, you know, Andreas, Stephanie, uh, I just wanted to say thank you for doing this. You know, we haven't done a hundred episodes explicitly of host stuff, but we've been doing this for a long time and you know in four episodes we've got uh got our one year anniversary coming up and you know it just i'm really looking forward to this uh next phase of it with you because clearly the next year is going to be very different than this last year yeah thank you so much i mean from the beginning i've just been really happy to be involved with this project adam it it came together we talked about let's talk bitcoin uh, history on the show before but the way that it came together was kind of serendipitous and it just ended up being a really productive and fruitful project so i'm just thrilled to have the opportunity to work with both of you and um i look forward to the next year yeah people sometimes ask me what the secret to success is in this particular space and as with writing here on this audio production the secret is to have an incredibly talented editor and producer who turns uh, bullshit we say into wonderfully articulate narratives of <laughs> high quality and you do that every time so wow. you fill a double role um, both as a host but also as an incredibly talented sound engineer and thank you so much for giving us this platform Well, thank you very much for the praise, Andreas. And thank you, you, the listener, who has actually made this something that is, uh, you know, is worthwhile doing. Because although I do love hearing the sound of my own voice and Andreas is a lot of fun to edit, 
uh, it really is about kind of sharing these ideas and trying to have these conversations in public um, because they're important conversations to have. And so that, I mean, for me, that's been the most gratifying part about all of these uh, experiences that I've had with people who are listeners is people come up to me and I'm sure that uh, you guys get this too and say, you know, like I thought about Bitcoin differently or I thought about cryptocurrency differently before I started listening to Let's Talk Bitcoin. And because, you know, and, and, and those conversations influenced me, you know, Charlie Shrem said that the other day, I, it just totally floored me. I was like, wow, I, you know, I had no idea because again, mm. like we kind of got in, in the generation after a lot of the super early adopters, right after the Roger Beers and the Eric Voorhees and the, you know, the Charlie Shrem's people like that, who are kind of the first generation, you know, and again, like this episode is going to be forever long, but, uh, but I kind of just want to talk about this, how many people we've seen fall not just in terms of Charlie Shrem, you know, being on house arrest, but just in terms of the amount of people who are really big players in the Bitcoin space for the early years and who now have either retreated out of the country or have, you know, basically dropped to quite lower profile. I think Roger Veer is an interesting example of that, who has just become so overwhelmed with projects, it seems like, that he has almost no public presence whatsoever anymore. You know, the only person who's really seems like they've succeeded, the only company that's really succeeded from that first generation has been BitPay. So, I mean, like, I'm trying to think of other companies that are still around that are still relevant mm-hmm. as BitPay is. Can you guys think of anything else or has the legacy pretty much been cleaned out now with Gox and BitInstant and, you know, CoinLab and all these other foundational companies that are just kind of gone? It's the process of evolution. And while we owe a legacy of innovation to all of those who came before, now the space has evolved. It, it's become much bigger and much more creative and there's so much more happening nowadays it's really hard to compete not because no one else is joining because they don't understand it but because uh everyone else is joining <laughs> and, gradually and they don't the competition, understand it <laughs> well the competition is getting fierce there's a lot of very sophisticated uh programmers and business managers and operations managers and just generally professionals in the space who are doing some amazing things so mm. this is becoming a very mainstream uh, situation right now. And, and that's great. I mean, it represents the evolution into, into mainstream. Um, and, you know, over time, you're going to see new faces, I think. And that's always a good thing. So, what do you Adam, think, you Stephanie? Said, Should we start uh, libertarian coin? <laughs> Bitcoin was libertarian coin. And well, I think I know, it's but still the, could exactly. be. Exactly. <laughs> but if it's not now, do we need to start another libertarian coin? <laughs> uh, I don't know. I mean, that could just become co-opted too. I would like to preserve and honor the history of Bitcoin, honestly, as as a libertarian culture. I mean, it's a neutral platform, yes, as Andrea said. I completely agree with that. But the culture surrounding it, at least in the beginning, was incredibly uh, valuing of hu- human freedom and voluntary, peaceful interactions between people. And I would like to try to do a part to keep it that way. I think that, uh, you know, that, that we can certainly do our part, but I think Bitcoin speaks for itself really, really well. I think that this, it's exactly that principle of voluntarism and of, you know, and of basically only doing something that is in your best interest because it's in your best interest. And the other guy on the other side, he isn't doing something that's against his best, best interest. He also is voluntarily saying, this is in my best interest. Therefore, we should do this. Cause again, that's mm. something that no matter what you do with Bitcoin, you can't get away from that. It's not like you can be like, all right, well, we're going to change this this fundamental part of it. Yeah, and that's a principle that's been forgotten over time. You know, it's a very basic principle. The idea of trading with somebody else for mutual benefit, like that is one of the most basic human activities that we've been doing since the dawn of time. But it's been forgotten <laughs> because so many of our interactions today, there's somebody in the middle saying, no, 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 you can't, you can't, you can't, you got to do this, must do that, can't do that. And but why would we care if someone wasn't there doing that? Why would this be? I, I totally agree with you, Stephanie. But why, why would this be so important to us? Why would we be doing a show if we didn't have that problem throwing it in our face all the time? This is something that's important. This is something that we need to have alternatives to. There needs to be competition because lacking competition, there are only bad options. I, I agree. And there is competition. There is. And we're, we still have the chance to shape the discussion. And that's why we do a show like this. 
I'm looking forward to the next hundred episodes and the year that's to come because so many incredible things happened in the past year, so much evolution of this space. I cannot even imagine what Bitcoin is going to do uh, now that it's reached such a level of awareness across the world, what can happen in the next year? And it might be amazing and it might be terrible, but it's probably going to be uh, mostly amazing, I think. And we're going to see some incredible growth in this new concept of cryptocurrencies and the blockchain technology. And I'm looking forward to it. I really am. Yeah, things will be different. I mean, that's the one thing that I feel really comfortable predicting is that the situation a year from now will be aggressively different. You know, an April Fool's a year from now, it's going to be aggressively different than it is today. And I don't, you know, it's, it's wild. Again, I, I'm uh, as happy as can be to, to be in the position to be able to kind of watch all of this and actually have some kind of idea of what's going on because this is, this is a, this is a very important time and very few people actually understand anything about it. Just to wrap up, guys, you never give your email addresses. Please reach out to me at letstalkbitcoin.com. I'm looking forward to year of interacting with the community and learning as much as I can from all of you. And you can email me at Stephanie, S-T-E-P-H-A-N-I-E at letstalkbitcoin.com. You can always get me at Adam at letstalkbitcoin.com. Guys, thank you very much for this. This has been an epically long episode. Have a great couple of days. Thanks for listening to episode 100 of Let's Talk Bitcoin. Content for today's episode was provided by Andreas M. Antonopoulos, Stephanie Murphy, and Adam B. Levine. Music for this episode was provided by Jared Rubens and General Fuzz. Any questions or comments? Email Adam at letstalkbitcoin.com. Thank you.